Bonjour tout le monde, c'est Thibaut Gouty et on est à l'écoute sur MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Uh, hello everybody, it's Thibaut Gouty and we are tuning on MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Get ready for an hour and who knows of daily fantasy sports analysis from our panel of experts. Without further ado, let's meet the team from New York. He's the Don of all Beast Motors, the boat himself, Beast Mode Cow. From Cambridge, Minnesota, he's a father of four and has the most glorious beard in all of the DFS. It's Eric F. And last but not least, he's so St. Louis, ask his tattooist. He's the host of our show, the master of black Negro jiu-jitsu himself, Leroy Stephan. Before we get into this podcast, big shout out to our sponsor, Ball Club Box at BallClubBox.com. Ball Club Box is a sports apparel provider that provides their subscribers with monthly gift boxes full of quality licensed sports merchandise that reflects their customer support for their team. Usually these items only appear at specific stadiums or sports stores, but they intend to make it easier to customers to support their desired franchise without leaving their homes and in some cases state by offering this subscription service. You pick the team's. They pick the items and send them to you each uh, month. There's three different boxes. You got the club box, $55 for $75 worth of apparel. The executive club box, $75 for $125 worth of apparel. And the ball club season plans. That's the deal right there. That's $150 for three uh, seven, uh, $75 boxes worth $125 each. That's $375 worth of stuff. That's $225 more than you pay. Ballclubbox.com. Go check it out. I'm telling you, they're the shiz. Also, do me a favor, go check out Kobe's Corner. That's Kobe with a K. Corner with a K. Uh, I hope there's not another K. But go check out Kobe's Corner on YouTube. Uh, also, go check out Kobe's Corner.com. That's two Ks. Um, I'm a writer for the site. Kobe did the intro. Good friend of mine. Great YouTube channel. Analysis, breakdown of fights. On, of course, articles by me and other MMA Journalists, podcasters, whatnot, Kobe's Corner, man. Go check it out. One of the fastest growing YouTube channels for MMA and one of the best online. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. UFC Fight Night 120, Dustin Poirier versus Anthony Pettis. I'm your host, the master of black Negro Jitsu. And today I'm joined by my co host, CG3 Analytics, Kyle Davis, Eric F. Beast Mocal are not with us tonight. That being said, let's jump right into it with our quick picks from our expert fighter of the week, T-Ball Guti, coming to us, Shay La France. I hope you enjoy his picks. T-Ball Guti, soyez mm -hmm. le bienvenu, le bienvenu de le MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. T-Ball Guti, welcome to the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Uh, Going to get your quick picks for UFC Fight Night. 120 Poirier versus Pettis. I'm going to start at the top at the main event. Dustin Poirier versus Anthony Pettis. Who's your pick? Uh, Dustin Poirier. Awesome. Co-main event. Matt Brown versus Diego Sanchez. Who's your pick? Hey, he's my friend. He's my teammate, so I'm going to say Diego Sanchez. And I think he's going to win. He's a very good fighter. All right. Andre Ovlowski, who I think is another one of your teammates. I don't know if he trains down at Jackson Winks anymore. Uh -huh. Versus Junior exactly. Albini. Uh, Andre. Nate Marquardt versus Cesar Ferreira. Um, I would say Nate Marquardt here. Yeah. Okay. Rafael Asuncao versus Matthew Lopez. Asuncao. Okay. Joe Lozan versus Clay Guida. Uh, Lozon. John Dotson versus Marlon Moraes. Yeah, it's another teammate. Uh, and he's very good too. And I'm going to say Joe Dotson for sure, man. All right. Tatiana Suarez versus Vivian Pereira. I think I'm going to say Pereira. Sage Northcutt versus Mitchell Quinones. Uh, Norcutt. Angela Hill versus Nina Ansarov. I'm going to say Hill. 
Sean Strickland versus Court McGee. McGee. Marcel Fortuna versus Jake Collier. Uh, I'm going to say Marcelo. And Carl Robinson versus Darren Stewart. I don't even, I don't know Carl Robinson. I don't know if you do either, but there you go. What do you think? I'm going to say Robertson. Okay. Gucci, merci beaucoup pour ta contribution à le MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Thank you very much for your contribution to the show today. And uh, it was great having you on. Okay, thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed those picks from our special guest analyst, T-Ball Gucci. He'll be joining us on the School of Black Negro Jitsu soon. Uh, one of my fellow French uh, francophones. Enjoy having him home. Home to have Tom Duke and Wild, Mikhail LeBou, Francis Ngannou, and all the rest of the great French fighters throughout the world. But tonight, we are not here to talk about uh, the French fighting scene. We're here to talk UFC Fight Night 120, Poirier versus Pettis. And uh, let's get right into it. There's There shouldn't be any delay. Our first fight of the night is going to be Carl Robeson versus Darren Stewart. Carl Robeson is going to be coming into this fight at $8,800. Stewart is coming in at $7,400. I really like Roberson. Um, I, he's a striker. He's fought in the Glory Kickboxing Series. I don't, I'm not quite up on his background, still doing research on him, but I know that he's a finisher, and I know Darren Stewart is extremely underwhelming. I'm not interested in Stewart too much. I think Roberson steamrolls him here. Uh, I, I won't trust him completely, but I'm playing a lot of heavy Roberson. I think Roberson is a cash game play. I think he's excellent in GPPs. I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. Maybe Stewart is worth the play because we don't know what we're getting, getting from the debuting Roberson, and he's just a striker. But um, Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? Yeah, I think this one's a toss-up, too. You know, Roberson, I'm going to assume that he's the favorite going into the fight, and I had a chance to watch some of his kickboxing fights. Um you know, he should be the better striker in this. But he's making his UFC debut. Um, what's he priced at? 8800 You know, that's pretty pricey for a guy with a lot of uncertainty there. So I'm going to try to avoid this matchup as much as I possibly can. I think there's a lot better value on this card. You can go with Strickland, $8,700. Um, even, you know, a wing in the dark like Sage North cut at 8500 I think there's some some better alternatives out there, so I'm probably going to fade this fight in tourneys. And, of course, Kyle Davis is turning only his opinions. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? So Roberson was on Dana White's Contender Series and disposed of his opponent, Ryan Spann, in about 15 seconds. He was able to stuff the takedown and landed four powerful short elbows, and, uh, you know, Spann went flat, so... uh, Roberson's an accomplished kickboxer, and I actually like him a lot in this spot. Uh, just like you said, Laura, I'm not very impressed with Darren Stewart. I thought he was uh, very underwhelming in his first two UFC fights against Burroughs. And uh, I think Carl Roberson might be low-owned because not many people know who he is. So I like Roberson in cash and GPP. Yeah, and, and, and the way he finished with those elbows, that's what he's going to be facing in this fight. Stewart is going to try and ground him out, take him down. And uh, that 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 really sparked a lot of confidence in me personally when I saw the ferocity of that finish. Next up, we've got Jake Collier versus Marcel Fortuna. This is going to be a middleweight bout, and uh, Collier is coming in seventy six hundred dollars. Fortuna is a thousand dollars more expensive at eighty six hundred dollars. Oh, Fortuna has improved in striking. Black belt Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Collier is well rounded, but trains out of a small camp. I myself, of course, Kali, I think this is a close fight. Um, I don't know if it's $1,000 of range in between it in the cage. So I like Kali better because he's more flexible. But Fortuna, Kali can be hurt, and he has been in fights, and Fortuna's got some power. So I like both of these fighters, actually. I think they'll be contrarian and low-owned, both of them. So I like this fight. I can't trust either. This is not a nobody's a cash game play. Kyle Davis, what do you think about this fight in GPPs? I like it. Won't have a lot of it because I like some fighters in the same price range. But I, I do love how contrarian it is. I actually like Fortuna in this one. Like you said, he has a lot of power. Potentially gets a real early round finish with this fight. Um, but when I'm looking at these prelims, I don't know. You know, DraftKings, you always have the option to play the entire card. 
where that includes the prelims or just the televised events with the uh, excludes the prelims. And I think this is a good one. Like if you want to try out just doing the main card, this is probably the best one to do so. Like this card or the prelims, you know, you're looking at them. There's some toss-ups in this fight. And then if you look at the value, I mean, is there really good value with this fight? Um, possibly. But I'm going to go for Tuna and early stoppage here. Ah, okay. And CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? Fortuna averages 3.7 strikes per minute, slightly higher than Kali at 3.5 strikes per minute. Um, just from watching the tape, I'm more impressed with Fortuna. Uh, Fortuna. He seems to be more well-rounded. And one thing I like about Fortuna, he's never been finished. So just for that reason alone, he's in play in cash for me. Uh, Kali has been KO'd twice, and he's been submitted twice. But um, I kind of picture this being a back-and-forth decision, and I like Fortuna more. And I think Fortuna has a better chance to finish the fight. Um, I'm kind of hoping that Fortuna can go in there and take advantage of Collier's 59% takedown defense. So I'm hoping he can take him down, work the Jets. I definitely like Fortuna in cash, but I think I might sprinkle on him, uh, sprinkle him in in GPP as well. Yeah, I, I like Fortuna. I think he's got some finishing upside there. But on to our next fight here. We've got Court McGee versus Sean Strickland. Court McGee is going to be coming into this fight at um, a price of $7,500. Sean Strickland is going to be coming in at $8,700. And I'm really, um, I like Court McGee in this fight. I, Strickland can be low output and ain't active. Court McGee is extremely active, as I'm sure CG3 Analytics will allude to in his statistics later. But um, Court McGee, this should be a Court McGee never gets blown out. He's extremely, he's got an extremely high strikes landed per minute. Um, I think Strickland is a contrarian GPP play, not as good as Fortuna. I don't like the finishing upside here. I think this has decision written all over it. Not sure what Vegas says. I usually go with my gut, though. But this looks like a decision to me. So Strickland is not a favorite of mine in GPPs. Um, this should be a super close fight. I love McGee. Love his activity. He's a safe cash game play because how many points he scores. Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I am the complete opposite of you here. I like Strickland in this fight. Um, I will agree with you that I think this may go to a decision. But Strickland, you know, he was on... A little bit of a winning streak before he ran into Usman, but um, you know that's nothing to really get too disappointed about. Usman's pretty much been running through everybody that he's been facing lately. I do like Strickland here. Um, I think that he's going to be a little bit more active than he has in the past. You know, there's still some potential here with Strickland. Court McGee, on the other hand, you know he's on the downside of his career. This could be one of those fights where he gets ended early and uh, kind of questions things afterwards. So I would probably sprinkle Strickland in just a few different 20 plays here. Okay, CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? So Court McGee is coming in averaging almost five strikes per minute. So your idea is super high output. And Strickland is almost four strikes per minute. So, yeah, I think this is going to be a back and forth striking contest. But I think Strickland's going to be a little better on the feet in terms of accuracy and um court gets in there and he's a brawler i think he gets kind of sloppy and you know he's getting up there in age it's my preferred play is strickland i i don't know if he can finish court mcgee but um i think he can definitely score you around 75 points which puts him in playing cash game so my preferred play is strickland okay i'm on the court mcgee gee train but on to our next fight here we're going to be doing Nina Ansaroff, a.k.a. Um, Amanda Nunez's girlfriend. Uh, for all of you that, that are confused, Amanda Nunez is a lesbian, so is Ansaroff. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm not talking about best friends. I'm talking about girlfriends. They live together. And Angela Thanks, Hill. Oh, no problem. Angela Hill. Um, Angela Hill is coming in $9,000. Ansaroff, $7,200. That's an important um, detail because Ansaroff now has – like some of the best training partners in the world. Um, she's all and, and she trains with the champion of the division above them at Bantamweight. So they're fighting at Strawweight. And um, of course, she's training with the Bantamweight champion and all those champions that they have at American Top Team. Her, um, 
striking. What is that in the background? What is this going on? Somebody eating crackers? <laughs> oh my god. Somebody's eating something. But anyway, um Angela Hill uh versus Nina Ansaroff. I think this is a super close fight. Hill, um I don't think she's overwhelming with her fight style, so I don't like her as a GP play play or a cash play. I don't see the big points. Ansaroff, on the other hand, I can see her stealing this one just due to the fact of, of the quality of training she's getting and who she's training with. When you train with Amanda Nunez every day, you're going to get better. And we saw a better version of Nina Ansaroff in her last fight, and I think we will consent to continue to see a better version of her. She looked uh, solid against uh, jo Jocelyn jones Leibarger, who's a tough fighter. I think we're going to continue to see her get better at a solid clip with the quality of her training partner. Um, I love her in GPPs, not so much in cash, although she is in consideration because of where she is on the structure. And she's a straw weight, so her activity should be high. Her and Court McGee is kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of torn. Um, Court McGee gives me less flexibility, but I'm loving Nina Ansaroff and the value she gives you in what should be a close fight. But Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I'm picking Angela Hill to win. Ansaroff is a super live dog, though. Kyle Davis, what's your opinion? I think Ansaroff has the potential to actually win this fight. And this was the first fight when I was looking at the rank or uh, prices when they came out. I saw $9,000 for Angela Hill. I just scratched my head and said, what the hell is that price for? Hill, she hasn't done much throughout her career in regards to fantasy. Um, so that one kind of took me for a loop. Ansaroff, like you said, she's getting good training. She's around you know, people who have had championship caliber fights before. And at $7,200, you really can't go wrong there. This is a card where um, a lot of these underdogs, they are priced relatively high. So answer off at $7,200. She's a great play in 20s, and I'm probably going to be loading up on her if I need that flexibility there. CG3 Analytics, what do the numbers say? Angela Hill averages 4.5 strikes per minute compared to Nina Ansaroff at 3.7. Um, but like you mentioned, uh, Angela Hill fights at a high pace depending on who her opponent is. In her last fight against Ashley Yoder, she won a three-round decision and only scored 58 points. Therefore, at 9,000, I do not like her ceiling at all. Uh, Angela Hill is a fade for me in both formats, and I agree with both of you guys. I think uh, Ansaroff is a live dog. You know, Like you said, she trains with her girlfriend, Amanda Nunez, has top-tier training partners, and I think she has more paths to victory. Uh, Ansaroff has good technical boxing, although she does get hit a lot. But one thing she has that Angela Hill does not have is a ground game. So I think there's uh, more potential for takedowns and submissions with uh, Nina Ansaroff. So she's in play for me in cash and GPP. Yeah, I think Angela Hill is way overpriced in this spot. But on to our next fight, Michelle Capo Quinones versus Sage Northcutt at 170 pounds. Northcutt is coming in at $8,500. Quinones is coming in at $7,700. And, boy, I think I think this is going to be a cracker fight of the night. I was actually talking to Michelle Quinones about this uh, this fight when it first got scheduled. Uh, I talked to him a couple days ago about it. He's excited about it. He's expecting it to be a stand-up war. I think that two, two black belts in Taekwondo, I think that's for Northcutt. Karate might be for Quinones. He might be Taekwondo, too. I don't remember, though. But um, this is just going to be a back-and-forth war on the feet. Quinones has good takedown defense. What happened in his last fight, though, was he crashed due to two weight cuts in a row versus Jared Flash Gordon. Um, he had two big weight cuts in the, the, the span of a month. Gordon, of course, missed weight by, like, eight pounds for that fight. So that coupled with his weight cuts could be an on weight for both times. That hurt him. Uh, he also has some problems with his breathing. He's got some medication for that, thanks to the school of Black Negro Jitsu and Dr. Yair Basquez. So if he wins, we're getting a shout-out post-fight. Um, I'm rooting for Quinones, but I'm about to play this fight about even. Quinones is more flexible, but this is just going to be a cracker, probably 30 points of difference, uh, about equal significant strikes. Should be great. Quinones might go for a takedown or something. I don't know. Uh, we'll see, but... Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I'm playing it even GPPs. No, no in cash. Neither of these two fighters are flexible enough for me in cash. But what do you think? 
I'm actually probably going to fade this fight. Like you said, it's probably going to be a stand-up fight, so we don't have to worry about those takedown points or any of the points that you typically get when the fight goes to the ground. This is a complete coin flip for me. You know, Sage Northcutt coming into the UFC, there was a lot of promise. Looked like he was a superstar in the making and then pretty much just fell off once he got here. Um, I think this is a good opportunity for him to jump back on that horse maybe get a knockout in flashy fashion, but this fight is just way too risky for me. Um, Northcutt at 8,500, that's definitely too expensive for me. Keone is for 7,700, maybe, I don't know. I still couldn't even sprinkle him in in some 20 plays just based on that price. I'd rather go with some lower options like, uh, you know, Court McGee or Ansaroff. I, I'm loving Michelle Quinones. Um, don't sleep on him. He's, he's, he's talented. If you watch him strike, man, he strikes on a high level. It's going to be a super close fight. Whoever the dog was going to be, I, I think that's the, the, the play that you want because it's more flexible here. But, yeah, no takedowns probably. So I'm not all over it, but Quinones is definitely valuable if he wins because it's looking kind of bleak at the bottom here. Next up in our next fight, we've got Vivian Pereira. Coming into the fight against Tatiana Suarez, Olympic level wrestler Tatiana Suarez at 115 pounds. Pereira is coming into this fight at $7,000. Suarez is coming in at $9,200. And I thought Pereira had a good chance at first, but looking at the film, Pereira is extraordinarily undersized for this fight. She's at a four inch height. Uh, disadvantage. She's at a significant reach disadvantage of about four or five inches, and she's a much smaller woman overall. And she's her wrestling is not on the level of Suarez. Uh, Valerie Letourneau took her down and mauled her about six to eight months ago. That was ugly. Valerie Letourneau is not a grappler. That being said, um, I am absolutely uh, on. Tatiana Suarez. I love her as a play. I think she dominates. I don't think Pereira could improve her wrestling that much in this short of a time. Pereira is in play, though, but she won't score much in a win. I say that, but at that point in the price range, what does it matter? Um, Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I love Suarez in cash. Love her in GPPs. Don't know if I can fit her in in cash, but I think she's a cash game play. What do you think of this fight, though? I think Suarez gets the win here. But at 9200 that's way too expensive for, you know, you're expecting her to take Pereira down, kind of hold her down and get those ground and pound points. There's a possibility there. I always prefer early knockouts and whichever fights have that potential. That's usually what I lean towards. And Pereira at the same time, she's, this is pretty much both of these people are undefeated. Um, Pereira, you know, she is undersized, but she is scrappy as well. And at $7,000, you know, if you want to throw her in some 20 plays just to get a little bit more flexibility with loading up some bigger locks, I mean, I'm completely cool with that. So Suarez, I don't know, maybe you fit her in a couple lineups if you max out your entries. Pereira, I would definitely rotate her in just because, uh, you know, this could be something that goes all three rounds and she gets a relatively high floor. CG3 Analytics, what do the numbers say? Suara secured three takedowns in her last fight and scored a first-round submission. Uh, she is a very high-level wrestler, and Vivian Pereira has 50% takedown defense. So there's not a whole lot of fighters that I like at that $9,000 range, and Suarez is my favorite of them all. Um, <clears throat> you know, I understand a lot of people are looking for those first-round finishes, but if Tatiana Suarez can lock up five to six takedowns, numerous advances, some ground and pound. She can very easily put up north of 100 points. So I like Suarez a lot, but every time I bet against Pereira, she comes back to haunt me. You know, she beat Letourneau. She beat Jamie Moyle. She's very tough, but I just think this is a bad matchup. So I like Suarez in cash and GPP. Yeah, Letourneau and Moyle. I think Moyle might have been injured, and Letourneau went through a deadly weight cut. So I think she's been getting kind of lucky. I think this might be where her luck runs out. But she has been pulling off these upsets, so I'm probably going to throw her in because uh, she's, she's been burning me. Anyway, next up, next fight, John Dotson versus Marlon Marias. Um, John Dotson is going to be coming in at $8,300. Marias coming in at $7,900. This is a uh, 
fight that's going to be taking place in the bantamweight division, 135 pounds. Marlon Moraes is good, but is he as I, I just think of John Dodson. I think Marias being a level below that. I probably need to play this fight like next to even or something like that because I'm liking Dodson a lot and just saying Dodson's going to win. But Marias is talented. I just figure Marias is not on John Dodson's level. Like he's good, but like he showed in his last fight, not as good as they were hyping him out of uh, coming out of World Series of Fighting. So, man, I think you got to sprinkle some Marias in there. If you're playing John Dodson, you probably should have both guys just to be safe. I think that's the way to go. This is a no-no in cash unless you don't have any choice but to go to this fight. Um, probably it, it probably won't score very highly either. The winner will probably end up with between 50 and 70 points. So no-no in cash probably. Probably better to go low. And shoot for a, a big finish up high. Um, Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I agree with you. I think for this price, you sprinkle both guys in some 20 plays. Um, ultimately, I don't think it's going to be extremely high scoring for the winner. You know, maybe they are in that 70 round. Um, I give the, I'm going to go Dotson in this fight. I think he pulls out a decision. But Dotson, his style is very in and out, in and out. You know, he'll land a couple of strikes and then he's immediately out backtracking before he does it again. It's not one of those crazy high volume fights where he enters, you know, they exchange, they stay close to one another. I think it's going to be Dotson just picking him apart from the outside using his speed and quickness. And Marais, you said there was a lot of hype going into the UFC. He didn't really do too great in his debut, um, but I think still with his power, you know, you can sprinkle him in. And since these two fighters are relatively even priced, uh, feel free to sprinkle those guys in. No issue there. CG3 Analytics, what do the numbers say? <sighs> so Dodson averages 3.3 strikes per minute. Not super high output, but you have to remember for a bantamweight, Dodson has a ton of power. Um, he's a southpaw, which throws a lot of fighters off. He has 84% takedown defense, so he's going to make Morea stand and trade with him. I think Dodson is going to be a staple in the majority of my lineups, cash and GPP. I mean, you look at Moraes. I mean, he lost his last fight to Rafael Asuncao, and Asuncao only led, he only landed 43 significant strikes. I mean, if he can't outstrike Asuncao, he's not going to be able to outstrike Dodson. So I think Dodson's a very safe play. I like him in all formats. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm feeling, but I feel like I should show Moraes uh, respect. Maybe not in the 20 entry max, though. I might try and throw him into something else. On to our next fight, though, a fight that I'm very excited about watching. Clay Guida at 155 pounds versus Joe Lozon. This is an $81, $100 fight, uh, even fight. And you know LaRoss Stephens' rule. If it's priced even, you should play it even. But in this fight, I'm liking Clay Guida. Uh, Lozon needs to really get his wrestling going these days to get started, and he's not going to do that against Clay Guida. And so it's, he's he's got his very mediocre striking game that's left, and I don't think he outstrikes Clay Guida. Uh, Clay Guida's last performance against Eric Coke was super impressive. Eric Coke is a much better striker than Joe Lozon, at least cleaner. And um, I just don't – and Lozon, t uh, does he tend to fade? I know he faded in the last fight. Absolutely, he does. Yeah, yes, it happens does. every okay. fight. He's, he's a one-round fighter. And Clay Guida never fades. So this is a bad matchup for Joe Lozon. I'm not playing this one even at all. I love Clay Guida. Clay Guida and more Clay Guida. Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? Complete opposite here. You know, Clay Guida, he's a guy who's been around for a while – um, he does have that impressive cardio, which he does or should be better in Lozon with that aspect. But remember, Guida against Coke, you know, he brought him to the ground and pretty much laid on him. Is he going to be able to lay on Lozon like that? Probably not. Lozon, he's one of those guys with a real dangerous guard. So Guida might not be too enticed to actually go down to the ground with him. Um, since this price is com priced absolutely even, I'm going to be doubling up on, well, not doubling up, splitting these guys evenly between uh, the rosters that I'm putting out there. But I think this one has the potential for extremely high points, especially if it goes to the grounds. We can see a lot of different takedowns, a lot of different advances. Um, I wouldn't be shocked at all if 
you know, 15 round or 15 minutes of this fight, 10 of those minutes is spent on the ground. Um, so I'm definitely going to be loading up on both of these guys for 20 plays. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think it, uh, Guido even needs to go to the ground. He could just keep it on the feet and just outwork loads on, but CG three analytics, what did the numbers say? Clay Guida averages 3.5 takedowns per 15 minutes, and Joe Lozon has 54% takedown defense. So I don't understand this. I think I thought Guida was going to be a much bigger favorite. Look at Joe Lozon's last fight, last three fights. I mean, in my opinion, he lost all three. Lost to Stevie Ray because he faded. Lost to Marson Held because he faded. And then he lost to uh, Jim Miller. I mean, he, he's very strong in the first round. But after that, he just fades, and you can't fade against Clay Guida. So I like Guida in cash and GPP. I think he can get you a lot of grappling points. Yeah, I, I love Guida. I don't even feel like hedging with Lozon. I think we we know exactly who Joe Lozon is, and we know exactly who Clay Guida is. I don't think there's any doubt about what these guys bring to the table. And Guida is a horrible matchup for Lozon, especially considering his gas tank. On to the next fight, though. Raphael Asuncao versus Matt Lopez. Um, Matt Lopez is going to be coming into this fight priced at $6,900. Rafael Sunsau is priced at $9,300. And, oh man, as far as I am concerned, um, I'm not too much on this fight at all. I think a Sunsau takes it, but man, should I play some Matt Lopez? He's a pretty damn good fighter. Like, but Sunsau doesn't get taken down. And I don't think Matt Lopez is the better striker in this one. That being said, uh, instead of wasting entries on Vivian Pereira I should pro- or Diego Sanchez, I should probably be playing uh, Matt Lopez, who just KOTKO'd Johnny Eduardo. I mean, this is an impressive fighter. Um, I, I, just, I just started adding Matthew Lopez to my playlist. So I was sleeping on him. No Asunsau under any circumstances. Asunsau never scores over 80 points in any matchup. So none of that for me. But Matt Lopez, I'm liking that. I'm liking that in GPPs. Maybe not cash, but GPPs. I like it. Maybe cash, but we'll see. Um, Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I think Asunsau is going to take this fight by decision. But at the price that Matthew Lopez is at, I'm not sure how you could avoid him in 20 plays. You know, Lopez, he is a guy who kind of comes out of nowhere. That Eduardo finish, that was pretty shocking. And, you know, like if you insert him into your lineup, that's going to give you flexibility for many, many other people. So whether you want to load up on Matt Brown, Tatiana Suarez, there's a lot of different people that you'll be able to fit into your lineups just because he's priced so low. And a Sun Sal, typically, he doesn't get finishes. So... Lopez, even if he loses, he's probably going to be in there for 15 minutes getting those floor or, uh, you know, those quick points. So I think he has a relatively high floor in this price. And at 6,900, you've got to play with him in some in 20. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? A Sun Sao averages 3.3 strikes per minute, about 1.4 takedowns per 15 minutes. But like you said, he, he never really scores highly. So at his price, he's a definite fade for me, and I am intrigued by Matt Lopez. He averages 3.2 takedowns per 15 minutes. He's a young, hungry lion coming up in that division. And yeah, I mean, Sun Sao does have 80% takedown defense, but he is getting up there in age. So if Lopez can land a few, if he can just win two out of three rounds, score some grappling points, he's definitely going to make value. So I like Lopez... I like him in cash and GPP. He's yeah, definitely my I, preferred play. Yeah, I like Lopez, man. I, he's a great fighter. I was just counting him out against the Sun Sao, but no longer. He has been added to my playlist down there at the bottom. We will have Matt Lopez probably in the place of Diego Sanchez here. Or maybe both of them. I don't know. Matt Lopez is a hell of a play this weekend. Anyways, on to our next fight. We've got Nate the Great. Marquardt, one of my very most favorite fighters in the entire UFC, going up against Carlos Fe, uh, Cesar Ferreira, excuse me, Mutanch. Um, man, I don't like this fight at all. $9,100 for Mutanch, $7,100 for the great. If you want to throw a dart at the great, you can, but he's slow now. 
He's older. Mutanch is faster. He doesn't have any grappling deficiencies. He's just as good of a striker, probably the more flashy, deep striker. Marquardt is older and slower now, so Mutanch should take this, but I won't have any of it in cash, none in GPPs. Kyle Davis, what do you think of this fight? I think your favorite fighter is going to be going down in this one. I think Ferrara, he's a guy on the upswing. Marquardt, you know, like, how much longer does he have? How much does he have left in the tank? That's something you're going to have to ask yourself going into this fight. And I just don't think that, you know, how does he really end this fight? Early knockout? Does he have the cardio to go three rounds? Yeah, I I just think he's older, man. He's just declining. That's all it is. It's not that he's... The only time he had trouble was down there in Mexico City in that altitude when it was something to it that caused that. But other than that, Marquardt, he's still... He- I'm going to go Ferrara on this one. Um, even though he's priced relatively high at 9100 I still think you're going to put him in some tourney lineups just because, um, you know, this one could potentially get ugly. And there's not a lot of locks on this card where you're saying, oh, I'm pretty sure they're going to win. But this is one for me, so he'll be in the majority of my tourney lineups. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? So Fajero averages 2.7 takedowns per 15 minutes. Marquardt's takedown defense is decent at 72%. I'm kind of with you on this one, Laura. This is probably going to be a fade for me for the most part. Probably have more exposure to Fajero, but I would rather just pay up 100 bucks and go with Suarez. I think she has a higher ceiling, and... You look at Fajera's uh, DraftKings log, and he, I don't think he's ever scored more than 90 points. I don't think he's ever reached 100. So, yeah, for the most part, this fight's going to be a fade for me. Okay. We are on to our next fight. We've got Junior Albini versus Andre Vlosky. Junior Albini is coming in at $8,900. Uh, Vlosky is coming in at $7,300. I, lo- I love this fight in GPPs. I don't like so much Arlovsky. Junior Albini completely destroyed Timothy Johnson, and nobody's ever done that. Really liking Albini. But should I hedge with some Arlovsky? Everybody's tell- uh, my my Black Market Picks co-host, Travis, told me I'm- I would be crazy for that. Don't waste my money. Um, I'm thinking Albini in cash, though. Am I crazy, Kyle Davis? Uh, Arlovsky, he gets hit and he grumbles. I think this is a bad spot for him. Kyle Davis, what do you think? Albini, all day in this one. He might be 100% play for me in 20 plays. I just think at a card where there's not so many locks, this one has the potential for a real early finish. And Arvlowski, what has he done in his previous fights other than crumble? There's no reason for you to give him any hope in this situation. And Albini, you know, he's a guy who's on the upswing. I think this could be potentially the last fight of Arvlowski's career if it's an ugly knockout. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? Arlovsky is on a five-fight losing streak, and his chin is completely deteriorated. But um, So <laughs> Albini's, <laughs> Albini's definitely my preferred play, but you know my philosophy. I like those low-dollar heavyweights. And <laughs> you look back at Godbeer this past Saturday, I mean, let's not talk about how he won, but he did win in DraftKings and put up over 90 points. So... Uh, Albini is my preferred play, but in tournaments, I will hedge a little bit with Orlovsky. Yeah, um, I'm loving Junior Albini at this point. Probably should add in some more Orlovsky, but it feels like a slaughter uh, for the young young line here. And it's too early to reference Walt Harris after last weekend. You got to give me like another month to cool down from that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not so pissed, though. Cody Garbrandt did more damage than Walt Harris did to me that night, man. Cody Garbrandt. Rip my heart out. Anyway, on to our next fight. Matt Brown versus Diego Sanchez at, uh, I believe this fight will be at, a, is it 170? Is this a welterweight contest? Or this yeah, 170. 170. Okay, yeah. this, this, uh, this is a welterweight contest. I uh, It should be a hell of a fight, so I guess both sides are in play. Uh, Matt Brown is a little too expensive, but hell, if you can fit him in, get him in. Diego Sanchez, Matt Brown is hurtable. Diego Sanchez can hurt you, and he's going to come to fight. So I like Diego Sanchez. Um, he's, he's uh, My Brown is hurtable to the body. Diego Sanchez can do that. I like Diego Sanchez. Rose not. Whenever we got a, a skilled veteran uh, or at the very bottom of price and tier, that's a mistake that we want to take advantage of, like with Rose not Yunus. Let's not miss out on Diego Sanchez, Matt Lopez. Let's take advantage of these cheap fighters. Um, 
Matt Brown, I, I just love this fight in general. It should, like, it's got great finishing potential. Play both sides of it. Kyle Davis, what do you think? I just realized what we were talking about. It. These are two of my previous favorite fighters of all time. Finally duking it out. This fight probably should have happened five years ago, but um, I'll take it for this weekend. This is a <laughs> this is an extremely weird fight, you know. Diego Sanchez, he's been a little chinny recently. Matt Brown at the exact same time, you know, he gets hit with a good body shot and he crumbles. Um, I'm looking at the pricing. You see Matt Brown all the way up at 9,400, and this is a retirement fight for him, so I'm sure he's going to want to go out with a bang, preferably an early knockout. But that's going to be relatively hard to do. You know, Sanchez comes charging. He's just one of those warriors. He's been in the game for so long. Uh, but I don't know. I would actually sprinkle Matt Brown into the majority of my lineups just because I think there's so much on the line for him. And Sanchez, he's one of those other guys who's been deteriorating. You know, he's got the experience under his belt. But his body, much like Matt Brown, there's just been in so many wars. I think Matt Brown's going to connect with something powerful early and put it away within the first round. CG3 Analytics, what did the numbers say? You have Matt Brown averaging 3.8 strikes per minute, but is coming off a three-fight losing streak. I just don't know how you can be comfortable with him at 9,400. I mean, I know Diego was knocked out in two of his last three fights, but Diego is still one tough son of a bitch. And like you mentioned, Brown can get hurt if you go to the body on him. So, I don't know. This, t- t- to me, uh, this, is, this is almost a coin flip. I don't think that Matt Brown should be as big of a favorite as he is. He hasn't been reliable in a long time. So, for the most part, this fight is going to be a fade for me. Although, from a fan perspective, I love this fight because I've been watching these guys for a long time. Yeah, I'll say it. I'm going to load up on Matt Brown with the caveat that he could very well screw me over and pretty much destroy my night. Um, I just think the high risk, high reward potentials there. So uh, I'll, I'll try it out. See what happens. All right. Yeah. I love both sides of it. Matt Brown is super hard to fit in though. I've been trying it and it's hard. Anyway, on to the main event of the night, Dustin Poirier versus Anthony Pettis. Dustin Poirier is coming in at $8,000. Anthony Pettis, $8,200. This fight is taking place at 155, and I don't know how to call this one. I'm thinking Anthony Pettis. Dustin Poirier is hurtable. Anthony Pettis has improved his wrestling. He's pretty good off his back. Dustin Poirier, he's got good power, though, and he's got good wrestling. That's frustrated Pettis in the past. But like I said, Poirier is chinny and hurtable, and Anthony Pettis will hurt you. Uh, I'm just kind of playing this one even at the point this point because I don't know how to call it. But I want this fight in every lineup. How do you guys, uh, how do you feel about this, Kyle Davis? I'm just kind of playing it even at this point. I don't know how to call it. Can't trust either guy. Yep, I'm in the exact same boat. And thankfully for us, these two guys are relatively priced, very similar to one another. Um, Poye, he was a guy that when he first came into the UFC, you know, he was pretty much jumping, jumping. You heard some... Uh, advice from Tim Crater saying, hey, this guy could be the next best thing. And his first couple of fights in the UFC, he did look like he could be a potential superstar. Then he ran into Conor McGregor. I think that hurt his confidence. Then he started playing the uh, what weight class am I am game. Um, That's been resolved, you know, and I think now he's a more complete fighter than when he first came into the UFC. I think there's still some potential there. Like maybe he's one of those guys who could potentially fight for a title one day, depending on how many of these guys that he knocks off. And I think Anthony Pettis, that's going to be a good stepping stone for him. You know, Pettis, he's a former champion. Um, He's not too far along in his career. So if he wanted to make another championship run, he obviously could, considering he just fought for the title. But this is going to be a real important match for Poye, and I think he steps up here. I could see this one going all five rounds. I could see it stopping early. Um, but like you said, I'm going to play this one pretty even and just kind of sit back and enjoy the main event, hoping that uh, it goes relatively long and both these guys get tons of points. CG3 and the Lakes, what did the numbers say? Dustin Poirier is coming in averaging 5.1 strikes per minute. Averaging about 1.7 takedowns per 15 minutes. So the metrics definitely favor Poirier, but I just like Anthony Pettis. And I watched 
<clears throat> both of these guys recently fought Jim Miller, and I watched both of their fights, and I just thought Pettis looks better against the recent common opponent. Pettis's kicks give him a completely different dimension. They're so fast, they're so fierce, and at any time he can just end a fight with that with that roundhouse kick. And that's something Poirier hasn't seen in a while. I know Poirier has the wrestling edge, but I think Pettis can kind of mitigate that with his defensive jiu-jitsu. It's definitely one that you have to hedge, but I think Pettis has more outs, and he is my preferred play. All right, guys. That about wraps it up for the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast. Big shout-out to uh, T-Ball Guti. Make sure you go follow him on social media. Uh, I'll post those links in the description and on Twitter. Uh, if you want the, well, hell, go tune in to Black Market Picks too and School Black Negro just turn, coming at the end of the week. I don't think there's anything more to say. Thanks to my co-host Kyle and CG3 Analytics. We'll catch you next week. Peace out, guys. See you later, guys.